a long time ago. I think it was probably about 39 years. <laughs> That's about how long ago it was that I got saved. But a long time ago, maybe 35 years. Might have been a few years after I got saved. But a long time ago, I had an opportunity to choose the direction my life would go. I actually have been presented quite a few times different opportunities, but this time Jesus spoke to me direct. He said something to me that comforted me for the path that I would choose because it wouldn't be the same one that most people would take. What he spoke to me when he talked to me audibly, and he did, and it was a very <laughs> real conversation. And uh, words just don't compare to what I might say about it, but the, and it's been more times than once. But when Jesus spoke to me, one of the things that he said, <laughs> and he said a bunch of things, some of them I remember, some of them I, I imagine he sealed up that I don't remember yet. But one thing he spoke to me very direct was that, or he ended our conversation with. Matter of fact, I think it was the last words of our first conversation. And it's what just sealed the deal for me because it was like something that was going on in my life and there was no way anyone could have known. He said, there is a place for you in my kingdom. Uh, I was lost, you know. By the time I recovered from that, you know, the conversation was over and... and Jesus was gone, so to speak. <laughs> they were gone, but the conversation was done. I learned that lesson very profoundly in many different ways of how God applied that to my life, throughout all of my life. Because in my day, when I got saved, everyone was becoming pastors and ministers and worship leaders and teachers and elders and deacons and all these other things. I became a volunteer. I volunteered for everything. I volunteered to work behind the scenes in Calvary Chapel Tape Lending Library before it became pastoral led and directed. But it was at the early days with Eileen and Maddie and I and like 40 other volunteers. So maybe 30 now. But there were a bunch of volunteers that kept the quote unquote ministry going that Romaine loved and seemed to you know, have nothing but flowering words to say which was amazing to me because <laughs> he loved Maddie and I mean but uh, I volunteered you know to go to the college and career and set up chairs and used to do it regularly with Keith Thornton and I can't remember her name before she went overseas the singer you know I used to volunteer to you know, work with the sound booth, you know, to bring down the tapes on Sunday morning so that we could take them over to the tape laying library and have them ready to go for the services, you know, so that way they would be recorded immediately and we could just dupe them as fast as we could, running our woolen sacks, you know, like crazy. I remember volunteering, you know, for many things at Calvary that you never got paid, you never were in ministry, you were a volunteer. And you know, Jesus blessed me eventually with a poem that summed up the story of my life that says, others may, but you may not. And it's, I guess it's contained in the Westminster's Cat Abbey, Westminster Catechism, I think. But it's really by this woman that was written about, I think in the 1800s, it was a devotional. And um, it simply talks about what others can do and become famous and all these other things, but you may not. And I found it at one time, and I believe it was streamed in the desert, though I can't find it now, so it must have been in volume two, three, or four, but one of them. And uh, when God spoke to me on that, I cried for about a day. I, first time I read it, I cried, and just kept crying. I didn't stop crying. I know how to cry. <laughs> in other words, 
Yes, ladies, I know how to cry. I'm one of those. Give me a good cry and I feel better. Yeah. But I'll make it a good cry. And I did. I cried for about a day. And afterwards, I knew the choice I had made. Spurgeon called it the way of suffering. Um, some of the other, Ravenhill called it the path of righteousness, I think, or something. He called it some weird name. Um, different saints at different times have said there's certain ways that God will take you that he doesn't take others, that you'll walk alone, that you'll walk with him. You will have others that journey with you, but you will walk alone and make God alone your reward. I liked it idealistically at the time. I never realized how much cost would be involved to make it applicable to my life. Someone out there like me, maybe you are, that you may not be the pastor or the elder or the great evangelist. You may not get to do all those things that you see others do. But let me tell you this from my point of view of being able to hear God speak to me direct to hear God speak to me audibly, to know God personally, to have Jesus have fellowship with me, not every single moment of the day, but at times, you know, in a very real and personal intimacy, that if I had to do it over, would I choose another way? And the truth is, no, I wouldn't. If the Lord decided to include me in some of these great mega whatevers or mini or even just like small fellowship or home Bible study, would I? I don't know. You know, I'm a little selfish now. I'm a little jealous. I'm probably more jealous over my relationship with God than God is over his relationship with me. You see, I like and enjoy and am filled with what I got from God. And I like to include others with it. And I like to admit well within the parameters of their faith boundaries, their involvement with me in that personal relationship. But you know, sometimes I just want Jesus for me. Sometimes I just go to a church like I'm going to a church now, you know, because I believe you should go to a church. You know. I just believe you should. You know, it's like one of those, yeah, you do it, you know. And most of the time, I really didn't get much out of church, you know. I mean, it's no offense to him, but sometimes I might have been giving more to the pastor than the pastor was giving to me, you know. And I didn't say anything. <laughs> or sometimes I did. But the point is, now I'm going to a church where I really, because it's so right on, I really don't notice. It's just like, I'm just enjoying Jesus. It's like, I didn't even know there were people there. And there are. I didn't even know the pastor was there. And he is. I do know that he's right on because the message is really cool. <laughs> but, you know, I'm really not there with the pastor. I'm there with Jesus. And I really love it. <laughs> I really enjoy Jesus for who he is and what he's done in my life and what he is. Matter of fact, if I could have gotten away with it, and I really tried, I might have stayed as a hermit in Alaska someplace, you know, hidden out in the farthest northernmost outer reaches of how far north did I go? Pretty far, <laughs> up above Nome, you know. And uh, you can get pretty far up above Nome, but not much. And I even went farther. But. Being alone with God, while it is as has been so wonderful, there's also those moments where God takes you and makes you be with others and uses you to inspire others to move forward in their direction and their relationship to a point of maybe exceeding your own. And you are thrilled by that because you've suddenly become so attuned with your Father's heart that it's not just Jesus you begin to realize and recognize, but you become suddenly aware of God, our Father, as He is there. And that's why 
it's never enough to just go after the Son. It can never be enough to just get the Spirit or the gifts that He gives. It can never be enough to be in the ministry or do what God tells you to do in those things. But it will be enough when we find ourselves one with God. And until we do, there's always more for us to let go of and make choices thereof of which direction we'll go or whether we will know Him personally in a more intimate and personal way than we ever have before. What do you want? Do you seek great things for yourself? Jeremiah 45.5 are you seeking great things for yourself instead of seeking to be a great person? God wants you to be in a much closer relationship with Himself than simply receiving His gifts, or His presence as some people call it, or the Spirit. He wants you to get to know Him. And this is life eternal that they should know me and know him who sent me, Jesus said. Even some large thing we want is only temporal and incidental. It might just simply be a stepping stone to knowing Jesus. It comes and it goes. It starts and it ends. But God never gives us anything incidental or temporal. There is nothing easier than getting into right relationship with God unless it is not God that you're seeking, but only what He can give you and what you can get. If you have only come as far as asking God for things, you have never come to the point of understanding the least bit of what surrender really means. Have you given all for all? If you kept, I think you might want to do some spring cleaning. You become a Christian based on your own terms. You protest saying, hey, I asked God for the Holy Spirit. He didn't give me the rest and peace I expected. Matter of fact, he didn't give me the gifts. I don't have tongues. I don't have this. I don't have that. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Chomp, 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 bite, bite, bite. Choo, choo, choo. And instantly God puts his finger on the reason. You're not seeking the Lord, for the Lord. But you are seeking to get, rather than be God by God. You are seeking something for a reason you find hard to admit, but in reality it's for yourself. Jesus said, ask and it will be given you, Matthew 7.7. 7. Ask God for what you want. Don't be concerned about asking for the wrong thing, because as you drive her closer to him, you will cease asking for things altogether. Your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Matthew 6, 8. Then why should you ask? Why ask? Why bother? So that you may get to know him personally, intimately, and recognize how and who he got it. Are you seeking great things for yourself? Do you want to be the captain of the team? Do you want to be the number one ace all-star of all time? Do you want to be the great man of God or woman of God? Do you want to be a martyr? Do you want to be a servant? Do you want to sweep the parking lot? Do you want to clean toilets? Have you said, oh Lord, complete me, fill me with your Holy Spirit? If God does not, it is not because you are not totally surrendered to Him, but there is something you still refuse to do. Are you prepared to ask yourself, are you prepared to ask God what it is you want from God and why you want it? God, is, God always ignores your present level of completeness in favor of your ultimate future completeness. In other words, He'll ignore how ignorant you are now for what you will become in the future. 
just as ignorant as you are now. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. That's just one of those things that come through my mind, you know, you know, flitting through. But you see, he's not concerned about making you blessed and happy right now. That's easy. But he's continually working out his ultimate perfection for you, that you may be one just as Jesus and the Father was one. For the Father and Jesus were so in step that Jesus could say, I only do those things that are pleasing to my Father. And he could say this, I pray not as though you don't hear me, for I know you already hear me. And the reality is true that God does, and Jesus said it. Even as he said for himself, he could say for you. What is the reason you're doing what you do? And why do you do it? For myself, I fell in love with a person. And it's an unrequited love that will not be relinquished until the day that it is satisfied by the satiation of the completeness of the unity of love that God could give me because the depth of despair that I felt was so empty, bottomless, pitted that there was no love in this life that could ever be so filling me to say that I could be at peace until the day that I come in His presence and find fullness not of joy, but that God is love and I am completely overwhelmed in the fire of His being and not consumed for the fact of the reality of being in His presence and filled by that love that burns within my soul. Until then, I'll never be whole and I'll never be satisfied until I am satiated with the presence of God in Jesus. So what are you looking for? What do you want? What do you hope to get? I hope you realize what eternal life is all about.